oxygen therapy. As shown here, the air that we breathe is about 21% oxygen, and if that's all that's required, we consider this to be room air. So if you see a physician's order that says room air, that just means um, no oxygen is, has been ordered. Usually this is sufficient to maintain a cell's ability to function. However, in the presence of cardiopulmonary disease, it may become necessary to provide supplemental oxygen. We treat oxygen just like we would a medication. It has serious side effects, and we treat it like a medical order. So if the doctor orders two liters, we need to stick to that two liters. We don't get to just decide, well, you know, I feel like giving four liters instead, just like we wouldn't change the dose of an order of lisinopril without consulting the doctor. The one thing that is a little bit different about oxygen than a medication is when, when we need to adjust a medication such as, let's say, a pain medication, um, Norco, for instance, and the patient's receiving um, five milligrams of Norco and, it, and they're not getting sufficient pain relief. Well, we probably can um, up the dosage, but we have to get a physician's order first. So we don't give um, 10 milligrams of Norco and then call the physician and say, hey, the five milligrams wasn't working, so I gave him 10 and, and now it's fine. Of course not. We would call the physician first, and then the physician says, yes, you can give them 10 milligrams of Norco. And so that's the order of things. With oxygen therapy, we actually are given license to do it a little bit differently. So if we have a patient that's on room air, and we check their O2 sat, and they're 89%, um, and it's we try all of the, the quick things, like um, is the is the reading accurate? You know, are they moving their finger around? Is it um, on a finger that's too cold? Um, pull them up in the bed, sit them up, make sure they're awake. And we do all of those really quick interventions and they're still 89%. Well, they need to go on oxygen and yes, we need a doctor's order. However, what we are allowed to do is go ahead and put the oxygen on the patient because it might take a while to reach the doctor, especially if you're using phone. And so we can go ahead, put the patient on two liters of oxygen, get their saturation up so that they're not in distress, and then we call the doctor and tell the doctor what we did and why. Um, explain everything. This patient was 89%, I tried this and this and this, it didn't work, they were still 89%, so I put them on two liters. and. Then at that time, the doctor will say, yes, go ahead and give them two liters of oxygen, or they might say three liters or whatever. So in the case of oxygen, a little bit different than medications, we can actually start the oxygen and then get the doctor's order to back us up just because it's not good for the patient to wait. So that's the main difference. Oxygen is ordered usually in liters per minute or Occasionally, it's ordered in minutes or fraction of expired O2, which is um, that FiO2 that you see there. That's more used in um, like an ICU setting. So I would say 95% of the time that I've delivered oxygen to a patient has been in this liters per minute, and I think that's what you'll see. And just because um, the example I gave, I give 30% FiO2 is equal to 3 liters, that, that's not universal. So 20% FiO2 is not equal to 2 liters. It's a little bit different than that. Here's an example from an ICU setting that shows how it's ordered. If you look, let's see. Right here, you can see this person's on an FiO2 of 50%, and this is on a, a ventilator setting. And so that's where a lot of times you'll see the FiO2 is when someone's on a ventilator. The next question is, how is O2 supplied? And hopefully in clinical setting, you've seen several of these different ways. So this is a concentrator. It's a machine that takes room air and concentrates it into a higher level of oxygen. So these are nice, but they're very bulky. And so um, these are often used in the home or even the, a nursing home setting, but they're not very portable. Even though they have wheels, they're not portable for like someone who needs to go shopping. Also, we have um, tanks. This is a little bit better choice if someone's traveling. Um, a short distance, you can stick these on their wheelchair or when we have a power outage, of course, this won't work because it's an electronic device, so this is something that can work when you have a, a power outage. Um, this is when the facility has um, a wall 
oxygen. Um, it'll be clearly labeled. It's usually this green color. You see how this one says medical air, and um, it's obvious which one is oxygen, so that's another form of delivery. Here's some key points to remember when a patient's receiving O2. First of all, we need to continually monitor the flow rate or the FiO2, whichever is ordered. Even though your patient has been ordered to be on two liters, I often find when I've gone into patients' rooms that somebody, maybe it's the patient or the patient's family or um, the boogeyman perhaps, but somebody changes that. And so just because you set it at two liters that morning doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. So every time you go into your patient's room, if they're on oxygen, just do a quick check, make sure they're on the right flow rate. If they have a humidifier, make sure to, that it's um, properly stocked with the sterile water that's needed. Assess the patient's response. If they need more than what's ordered, we might have to call the physician. And post a no smoking sign on the door. I believe that's um, policy in just about any facility. This little guy right here um, can be very important. It's called a Christmas tree. And if you look back at wall O2, see there's the Christmas tree right there. and you don't use these, again, if you're using humidity, I already talked about that, but there were several times in the hospital setting where we needed to get a patient on oxygen and we needed to do it pretty quickly because they were getting into respiratory distress and um, had to find one of these. So just from experience, um, I tell you where these can often be found. Um, they're usually in a drawer in the nightstand if they're not already at attached to the wall and they're really small and so, they get lost easily, but that's a good place to look if you need one in a hurry. Complications of oxygen therapy. There's quite a few. Like I said, we treat it like a medication. One of the things that you're going to see a lot on NCLEX questions is the risk of hypoventilation in the COPD patient. Anytime we give oxygen above three liters, the person with COPD has kind of readjusted their normal, so they have a new normal, and they function on what we call an oxygen drive instead of a CO2 drive. And so I'm going to show you a video in pharmacology that explains this a little better, but just briefly, just know that high levels of oxygen can fool the COPD patient's brain into thinking it has enough oxygen when it really doesn't. And so it's not a never, 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 never give a COPD patient more than two liters of oxygen. However, we need to be very, very careful if we give them more than two liters and make sure that we have a physician on board and that there's a good reason. Obviously, if someone's saturation is in the 70s and they're on um, two liters already, yeah, they need more oxygen. But we have to remember that the COPD patient has um, special things going on that we can't just crank up their oxygen and expect it to work because we can knock out their um, respiratory drive if we do that. We also have to worry about toxicity, um, atelectasis, which is again collapse of those little tiny alveoli that are the functional component of the lungs, and um, this retinal damage, especially in the neonate. The type of oxygen delivery that we choose really has to do more with uh, how many, how much oxygen they're getting or how many liters. So here on this slide, I have three different ways, nasal cannula, simple mask, and non-rebreather mask. And I'll briefly discuss the difference between each one. With the nasal cannula, um, this is probably the most common one that you'll see. People like this because they can eat and talk without it getting in the way. And, but we really are limited on how much oxygen we can give this way. Um, I have here one to six, but really, once you get to five liters, you need to think about switching over to a mask. Again, this is the, um, the patients like this the best because it doesn't obstruct them from doing their tasks of daily living. Once a patient requires at least five liters of oxygen, we can start thinking about switching them to a simple mask. A simple mask does require a minimum flow of five liters to flush the CO2 from the mask. So you can never use a mask and have someone on, say, two or three liters, even if they prefer the mask. We have to have it at least five liters, but this is really the recommended six to ten liters of oxygen in a simple mask. Of course, these interfere with eating and talking. They can be kind of confining and cause claustrophobia, so patients don't like these as well. So the, really the only reason we would switch to a simple mask is for someone who's requiring more than six liters of oxygen. Remember, 
when you get oh, three liters or more on a nasal cannula, we need to add humidity. If we try to get, deliver 10 liters of oxygen through a nasal cannula, it's, it's too powerful. The nasal mucosa can't handle that. So again, one to six liters, you're going to use nasal cannula, six to 10 liters, mask. If you're right around that five to six liters, um, you can kind of go either way with that. Then th this is called a non-rebreather mask, and it's kind of like it says. It, it keeps the patient from rebreathing any of the carbon dioxide that is exhaled. So no CO2 is rebreathed, and these are obvious that they're on these because they have this little bag attached to them. These are used for 10 to 15 liters of oxygen or 90% or greater. There's also such a thing as a partial non-rebreather, which I don't have a picture of that. But it's, it's similar, although you can get by with lower levels, 6 to 15 liters. And on these, it still has a reservoir bag, but the patient rebreathes part of the exhaled gas. Here's a sample question regarding oxygen delivery. With a simple oxygen mask for patients, flow rates from the flow meter should be adjusted to, and hopefully you remember that it's 6 to 10. Again, these lower levels don't have enough pressure to flush out the carbon dioxide. This is a Venturi mask, um, also called air entrainment. Don't see these used very much, but this does not rely on what you set the, like if they're on wall oxygen. It doesn't matter what you set the wall oxygen on. What they're going to get delivered is based on the color of this part of the mask here. So are they color coded to deliver a very, very specific FiO2 percent of oxygen? So these are, are used, they can um, withstand anywhere from 24 to 55 percent or I think I have a 60% here. And it's when we want to be really specific with our oxygen delivery. Usually in the ICU, you might see something like that. If someone has a trach, they can use what's called a trach mask. And it's just like it sounds. It just fits right over the trach. It looks like an oxygen mask, but it fits over the trach. We can use that for one to six liters. And we can add flow by, which is just that air. And let me show you what that looks like again. Flow by is just when we use medical air to give our oxygen a little bit of a push. So they would be connected to both of these. Another way we can use oxygen is to piggyback it into either a CPAP or a BiPAP machine. Um, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, BiPAP is um, not continuous. They're very similar and most people use these without oxygen, but Occasionally, you have a patient that needs to use a CPAP machine and oxygen so it can be piggybacked in. Um, CPAP provides continuous positive airway pressure. It keeps the airway from collapsing, and these are used for people who have been shown to have um, an obstruction. So there's an obstruction of the airway when they sleep. Um, sometimes it's in the obese client, they just have um, too much fat around their throat, or um, several other reasons. BiPAP is used when it's non-obstructive sleep apnea. So this is sometimes called um, central sleep apnea. So there's not an obstruction, they just need a, a little bit of extra pressure for whatever reason. IPPB stands for intermittent positive pressure um, breathing treatments. These aren't used so much anymore, but um, just in case you see one, we'll briefly talk about them. These are usually used by respiratory therapists to deliver medications like bronchodilators. They're a lot like a nebulizer. However, instead of the patient breathing it in, it kind of forces it in, puts a little push behind it. And so because of that, they can sometimes be dangerous. They're especially contraindicated in COPD patients. And so many of our patients now that receive breathing treatments have COPD. So I think that's probably why we don't see these much anymore. This looks like a, a good stopping point. Take a break and then we'll cover artificial airways.